everybody. Welcome back to Pop Culture Warrior. I am, am, of course, your host, CQ. I am super excited for my guest tonight. My guest tonight is an incredible actor, best known to Star Trek fans for playing Dr. And, and you got to forgive me. I'm going to I'm going to probably butcher these words. Flox, the Den, Den, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm not good at words. Den, Denoblian chief medical officer of the Enterprise NX-01 on the hit show Star Trek Enterprise. Uh, he's He starred opposite Denzel Washington in the feature film Out of Time. He's appeared in the, the awesome disaster movie 2012. Uh, he's also starred in the independent film Breathing Hard, which won a number of awards on the festival circuit. He's been a series regular on The Others and guest starred in other tel television series, including The West Wing and X-Files, 24, True Blood, most recently shows like The Rookie, Station 19, and Pam and Tommy. Without any further ado, guys, I'm going to just jump right into it. I'm going to bring him right in. Let's get into it. Everyone, please give a huge welcome for Mr. John Billingsley, everybody. Yay! Woohoo! <laughs> now, perfect. Denobulin. Denobulin. Very like, good. Ah, man, I, that's a tough we one. I couldn't pronounce it on my show. That's why you don't <laughs> see a lot of Denobulins. You see Klingons, you see Vulcans, you don't see a lot of Denobulins. So, it's so easy. They got it so easy. That's so easy. Uh, well, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're so excited. The audience is hyped. Uh, guys, as always, if you have a question for Mr. John Billingsley, please put them in the chats. We'll read them off as they come through. Otherwise, we got a great, great interview coming your way. So first off, same as we do with every guest, I would like to ask you, sir, what is your military connection? So I will lift a glass to my father. Two Beer Billingsley was his nickname. He was a Navy man. He uh, joined the Navy in 1945 at the age of 18 and uh, served the last year of World War II as a clerk typist in San Diego, uh, pretty soft duty. But he then stayed in the Naval Reserve for 25 or so years, retired as a Lieutenant Commander JG. And uh, consequently, I have not a plug, USAA insurance. So every time I see those commercials, I think, ah, hey, Dad, mind you, I don't think USA insurance is any better than any other damn insurance, but still in all, I suppose, that is my, uh, that is my military background. That's and, wonderful. Uh, well, thank him for his service. Obviously, we all absolutely. appreciate his service. Uh, uh, a lot of people saying hi, giving you the old uh, Star Trek salute and everything. You get, you're getting lots of love already in the chats, so keep it coming, Fabulous. guys. Fabulous. Uh, uh, so obviously, this is a, this is a pop culture uh, talk show, podcast, what, what have you. Um, uh, I, I want to ask you, like, what do you, what do you geek out about? What's your, what's your passion? Because pop culture can mean anything for anyone. Yeah. So, so what do you geek out about? Well, here's the thing. I'm a, I'm first and foremost a reader. I love to read. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a librarian. I used to cut class and go to the library. I called my mother and say, I didn't feel like going to school. I'm in the library, and she would pretend to be upset. She would come to pick me up. We would then spend the entire day together in the library. So although I watch TV and I go to movies like any other normal person, I confess that most of my time uh, I spend reading. So in the reading world, I have my favorites, but in the um, film and television world, you've probably got a guest on who is much less versed than most of your other guests. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised, but go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. All right. All right. Um, recently, I would say things I have dug. I um, really enjoyed Better Call Saul. I've been enjoying Succession. Um, I'm liking the British show Sex Education with um, a woman I worked with on X Files, um, Scully. What was her name? Oh, oh, uh, 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 uh Gillian Anderson. Jillian Anderson. Jillian, An Jillian Anderson's about this uh, this big. And I had a scene with Jillian Anderson where I had to grab her from behind, and I had to do it in such a fashion as not to touch any of the objectionable areas, which was extremely difficult, I, I have to say. Jillian Anderson, I'm sure she's a fabulous actress, and I'm sure she's a fabulous human being, but you do not want the job of trying to grab Jillian Anderson without touching her, her pupils. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's just not much no, there's safe, not space. Enough, there's not safe space. No, there's not enough safe space. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I realize I digress from your question, but no, uh, not not at all. They, I I am ninety percent digression and ten percent water. That's outstanding. No, that that this is this is 
we this is free form, man. We're just gonna go yeah. for it, and wherever yeah. it goes, we're gonna we're gonna enjoy the ride. Uh, we already got Lucas in the chats who says I enjoy John Billingsley in anything he does. Oh, so, bless you. Because you haven't seen me in everything I did. <laughs> uh, let me let me direct you to some of my all time least favorite parts. Seven hours to judgment. Shredder Orpheus. Those are two big stinkers. Um, oh, I, I'm not going to go down this road. Why, why do I do this? Why do I engage in self abuse in this fashion? I, 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 I tell you, some of the best, the best are self deprecating. So I do a lot of stand up comedy. And okay. you know what? Self deprecation, it, it's, it's your bread and butter. It's money. It's exactly, 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 exactly. <laughs> uh, question from Rob in the chats Rob says, Would John, if offered, return for a revival slash another season of star trek enterprise i don't think it's likely you'd see another season of star trek enterprise but every now and again i hear some rumor that dr Flox, who was the only you know of course now living enterprise cast member being a denobial and we lived about 433 years old who could theoretically appear on some of the other shows so yeah bring it on Particularly because they don't make 22 to 26 episodes. Back in the day when I was doing <laughs> network television, wearing a rubber head for 22 episodes, that's a lot of, that's a lot of rubber head wearing. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're, we're going we're gonna to dive into that because I'm very fascinated yeah. by, by all aspects of the prosthetics and, and, and the thing. So we'll get into that. I think um, if I could write my own ticket, I would be a cartoon character. Now, that, <laughs> I would have to wear a rubber head for that. I could be on, uh, I could be on Prodigy. I could be on Lower Decks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's... lower deck. Hey, if the lower decks people are watching, get me on lower decks. We're gonna, we're gonna clip that. We're gonna put it on social media. We're gonna make it blow up. You get, you're gonna get an offer. Blow up. That's right. And my own show I would do, which is Old Fat Flux, which begins with Old Fat Flux sitting on a box and he's talking about old times back when I was a star for the CBI. All sorts of adventures. And then you'd have flashback music and young actors would run around in their underpants acting out all the things that I did. And then it would come back to me at the end. It would be, stay tuned for another episode of Old Fat Flux. And I'd be number one on the call sheet. I'd only have to work half a day. I'd make a lot of money. I'd wear the rubber head for that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you got to get the gig where you're doing the voiceover, right? You're just, you're just a narrator of the show telling the adventures of him, you know? That's right. I'm old enough to remember Death Valley days, you know, it was like somebody would come on and say, well, here's the story of the old West. And Mm. they weren't in the fucking episode. They made a fortune. (laughs) I'll take that job. Yeah. I'm I'm with you, man. Sign me up. I'll, I'll back you up. Yeah. I don't, I don't see that getting picked up, unfortunately, old fat flocks. But, you know, if I figure if I mention it on every single interview from now until the end of time, eventually I'll only increase, I'll only increase the likelihood. There's, there's got to be a ton of like fan fiction out there. <laughs> old fat flocks. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As I understand. Well, sir, not not any slash fiction. I doubt very much. Mm. I doubt I feature very often. In, you know, yeah. I would, obvious. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, Armin Shimmerman and John Billingsley are oh whoa, whoa, whoa holy cow. Uh and and and, and honestly, you, like you had mentioned um, you know, being a book reader is kind of something you geek out to. Uh I mean your background obviously says a lot. Um and I, I we, we discussed this real quickly before before we started that I had read a quote, and now this quote was from I want to say like 2013 or 2007, like years ago, and it said you had over 5,000 books, and, and you said, wait, what, what are we closer to now? I don't, I don't count them, but my guess would be somewhere between twelve and 15,000, I suppose. This I is mean. one room, and then, you know, all the other <laughs> rooms are equally. What I have is an extremely, extremely patient wife. When we first <laughs> married, she said, as long as they're on shelves, no stacks. Well, as you can see, that's a stack, that's a stack, there are stacks. And uh, my wife now is just, you know, she's given up. She's given up. She's given up on me. She's given up on my foibles. Somehow she's not given up on the marriage, but she's given up on uh, all the characterological deficiencies. I don't think it's given up. It's settled in. You know, it's, it's, you know, accepted. You're not a married man. It's abject (laughs) surrender. That is what marriage is ultimately defined by the extent to which you embrace surrender yeah and it, you can embrace surrender you're gonna have a happy marriage there you go and cause in the chat says man i hope you don't plan on moving soon because no i don't <laughs> this is my lad they're gonna have to take toes out on this house is that is that that's uh, the, you're basically building your tomb right that's like a, a 
<laughs> well, have you heard about the Collier Brothers? Pop no, culture I have reference. All right, the Collier Brothers. Now, this goes back to the 1950s. The Collier Brothers, <laughs> a war veteran and his brother, okay. um, they live in a gargantuan warehouse. One of them is disabled, sits in a the corner. They're pack rats. The entire place is newspapers and magazines and bric-a-brac to the ceiling with little, like, narrow, you know, pathways. The guy in the corner who's who's in a, in a wheelchair sends his brother to forage. The brother comes back one night, trips, knocks one of the fucking piles over, is buried alive. The other guy starves to death. The Collier Brothers. It was a big fucking newspaper article. Collier's Magazine, just coincidentally Collier's, not related, ran a big story about it. And E.L. Doctorow wrote a, a fairly well-known book called Homer and Langley, which is the, the version, the story of the Collier Brothers. That's how I'm going. Yeah. Well, I have, that book, it's got to be buried somewhere in there, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's just like, you know, an in, uh, you trip, and it's like, ah, I've often, I go down the stairs, and at the bottom of the staircase, there's like a, you know, big bookshelf, and I think, I know it's going to happen. I'm going to trip over the fucking cat, I'm going to hit that, st- <laughs> and, and it's like, all right, you know, there are worse ways to die. I mean, so at, at this point, let me ask you, do, do, uh, uh, and God forbid, we don't want mortality here, but, but when you go, is it, does it, does it get all donated to like the, the, you can, you can make the library of Billingsley. Right? Unfortunately, you, you... <laughs> this is a sad thing because, um, I used to be a book scout, you know, book scout. I really wanted to be a librarian when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. That's something I wanted very much to be. I, for a little while, made a buck as a book scout, which means that book stores would, would basically pay you to go around to garage sales and yard sales and pick up books for their store. And, um, and I continue to do it now. If somebody, like recently a woman whose dad passed away, I went and I looked through her collection. And everybody thinks that the, the books are worth something. And the reality is nothing's worth fucking anything. <laughs> You know, it's like, no, 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 junk, no, no, no. There are 18 billions. No, 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 no. By the time you whittle down a collection, I got a pretty good collection. But even I would have a hard time finding takers for nine tenths of it. Mm. You know, the resale value on used books, if they're not first editions in pristine condition, signed, extremely unusual books, it's pretty limited. Yeah. So, I, 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 sorry, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, Go no. ahead. No, no. It's sad. It makes it breaks my heart. Um, one of the things my wife and I have talked about, although I think we're far too lazy to do it, is actually kind of um, turn the house into like a trust to have it be kind of like a um, a writer's residence, like you know, give somebody a, a grant for a year to come just live in the house, take care of the house, um, keep the keep the collection going. You know, they can read. <laughs> it's kind of a limited use of a library, though. That kind of breaks my heart. I don't know. I, I, I don't mind thinking about death in the abstract. When I think about my own death in the concrete, it's always usually those kinds of things. It's like, what's going to happen to the fucking books? Who's going to feed the cat? <laughs> my wife will be bummed out for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she'll, she'll, you know, you know, it's like, yeah, she'll be fine. And then she'll, she'll move on. It's fine. I do, I do the same thing. I, my wife, I'm like, yeah, she'll be so sad for like a week and then start hitting the beaches. And yeah, I, the reality is that both my, my wife and I, I know, would be devastated, which is why I keep pitching to her the idea of a balloon accident. Like when both of us, are, if like we're both feeling kind of under the weather, it's like, you know what? I don't know. Let's just do it. Go get a balloon, hire a marksman, you know? That is, that is a choice. That is a, that is, that is a serious. There's I like no, it. it's creative. That's somebody who's read a lot of books. <laughs> yeah, there's no real, there's no real good way to go, you know. Right. Fair so enough. I, 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 yeah. I just, I don't know. I don't know. I'm uh, sorry, I've taken the conversation. No, again, this is this is this is what we're here for. This is All the right, stuff I okay. love for. Talk about I'm, death. We're not here to plug anything. We just love talking to people who've been in the business and been around and seen things and experienced things. And I I find it all so very fascinating. Um, Before we dive into any more, I do want to give you the opportunity. Are there any like charities? I know that I know you're a big supporter of charities and a big supporter of nonprofit. I want to give you the chance to talk about it, to spread the word and to, (laughs) to let people know what you're passionate about. I appreciate that. And um, yes, and I will plug the one thing that I want to plug, which is on January 14th, which is this Saturday, we are having an eight hour Jerry Lewis-esque telethon to raise money for the Hollywood Food Coalition. And that's eight hours for those of you who are listening or particularly Star Trek fans. It's eight hours of Star Trek guests, including Anson Mount and Scott Bakula 
and Brent Spiner and Jonathan Frakes and the Visitor and Terry Farrell and on and on and on. Um, this is to raise money. Basically, you know, trektalks.net. Go to it. You'll see all the different places you can watch on, on YouTube, yada, 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 yada. And throughout the day, We'll also be showing some short videos that kind of talk about the work that I do and the work that we all do at the Hollywood Food Coalition. And that's the organization I've been involved with for about six years. Started about 40 years ago, helping to serve people in need, a uh, hot meal on the streets and provide other uh, services, ancillary services, clothing and access to housing uh, organizations and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've grown in addition now to the wonderful meal we serve every night. And in addition to a panoply of services, including medical services provided by UCLA, dental, vision, and health vans, we also now rescue about 2 million pounds of food a year, and we share that food with about 130 other not-for-profits to buttress and augment their meal services. So, for instance, organizations that might work with women who have fled abusive households or senior citizens in some, you know, less salubrious housing complexes or some kids, uh, or there's a wonderful organization called um, uh, Village Family Services that works with kids at risk. And the premise is that, you know, for all the wonderful work these organizations are doing, if they're not serving really great food, nourishing food consistently, then probably the programs themselves, maybe they aren't taken as much. Mm -hmm. You know, they aren't, they aren't working. We found for Village Family Services that these kids who were getting like, you know, hot dogs and bologna sandwiches, when we started rescuing food from a lot of the shows and we were bringing in for instance, we started rescuing food from a show that Meryl Streep was on, and the kids found out they were eating Meryl Streep's fried chicken and corn on the cob and mashed potatoes and peach cobbler and buttered peas. It was like, hallelujah. <laughs> and surprise, surprise, attendance was up, participation was up, yada, 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 yada. yada. Wow. Um, I could go on and on about the Hollywood Food Coalition. It's a wonderful organization. One of the things we really believe in is that everybody's entitled to the dignity of choice. We always make sure that when we serve a meal, you have a vegetarian option, a vegan option, and what I call a carnivorian option, multiple salad choices and desserts. And as people come on a consistent and regular basis, the fact that you're building a relationship is what allows you to introduce them to other service providers. Mm -hmm. So it's the consistency and the reliability and the quality that actually allows us to kind of say, and now could we introduce you to who might help you get housed? Or who might help you into a program that might be of interest to you? Right. Wow, that's incredible. What 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 was it about that that drew you in at first? Yeah. Well, you know, a couple of things. One, it's always been, I think, in part, um, I was a theater actor for many years, and up until I was forty years old, I didn't have a pot to piss in. I was a teacher. I was a stage actor and uh you know it's hard to make a living on stage as a, I, I don't sing and dance so it's straight plays um so i've always had a, a kind of sense of there but for the grace of god go i in terms of just surviving i mean there were many months in my 20s and 30s when it was like how am i going to pay the rent this month i don't really know where i knew the stores that i could go and get free, say, you know, Costco, it's like, I can get free samples from Costco, Safeway gives away free samples, you know, so-and-so will buy me a beer if I go into that bar, don't go in that bar, because somebody's going to say, hey, you owe me for a beer, and uh, shit, okay. <laughs> uh, so some of it was kind of baked into the pie for me of wanting to give back once I got, you know, once I became more successful in film and television. I always kind of feel I owed that. And uh, some of it is, I really do think, you know, we live in a country where one out of five kids, for instance, is what they call food insecure. It doesn't mean they're going to go to bed hungry. It means they're going to wake up with uncertainty about when they'll eat, what they'll eat, how much they'll eat, whether what they eat will be any good. Um, that that has always just struck me as, as something that is, you know, obscene about uh, the richest country in the history of the world, not being able to ensure that you know, one out of five American children is going to get a decent meal. So, you know, for many years, I, I was on the board of an organization called the AIDS Service Center because I also, my dad was gay and uh, and I grew up in the theater. So, you know, I also had a lot of relationships with, with I still do, a lot of a lot of gay pals. And so that was also a large part of my life for many years. Mm. No, it's, I mean, wonderful organizations doing amazing things and uh, happy to to spotlight such a great organization and hopefully people contribute in any way they can because that's uh it's definitely worthwhile obviously uh, 
I support lots of veteran initiatives myself. Of course, of course. And, a- yeah. actually, the vet we work with the we work with the veterans. It's a couple of the long, long veterans of Long Beach uh, is one of the one of the groups that comes to us on a regular basis. Um, we do something called we call Sack Lunch Sunday. We have hundreds of people in the community who make these wonderful, you know, multi-element sack lunches. We have them all dropped off by families at our location, anywhere between two and 3,000, and then we distribute them. We fan them out to social service organizations who fan them out in turn to people in need all over the city. And there That's are a number awesome. of veterans groups that participate in that. That's so good. That's so good. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. Very, very much yes, appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thanks for asking. Excellent work. Um, so... Let's talk a little bit about your 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 acting career, your All right. your career. I know right. that uh, you you broke Fourth into thing films. With <laughs> I've I've done my homework. I've done my homework. Right. Uh, I know I know that you broke into films in 1988. You you made your debut supporting role in the thriller Seven Hours: The Judgment. Um, I'm curious, and, and you talked about it a little bit how you 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 know you dreamed of being a librarian growing up. Do you recall um, the time? Uh, leading up to that, getting that that debut film and and that supporting role, do you remember like w- when did you make the conscious decision? I want to follow this. I want to make this a passion. I want to. Oh yeah. I make well, this a I career? mean, I'm being, I'm being somewhat facetious. I mean, I I loved libraries. I loved being in libraries. I loved going to bookstores. I loved to read. But I I knew that I wasn't going to be a librarian. For one thing, it's library science. As soon as I heard the word science, it's like oh, it's not going to work. I thought, you know, they're going to make me learn a bunch of shit. I'm not going to be the guy. I just like the idea of sitting behind a desk going, oh, you know what you'd like? Try this. That's what I wanted to do. Mm. Uh, No, I always knew I was going to be an actor. When we moved up from the South, where I lived when I was a kid, to Connecticut. So I was a Louisiana kid moving up to Connecticut. And I taught like this. And I was prior immediately. It's like all the Northern children, we're going to beat the South out of you. But they had mandatory school auditions for A Christmas Carol. And I was the only kid, because I love to read, who could actually pick up the text and bring it to life, even with a funny voice and a lisp. So I was cast as Scrooge. And so for that brief three-week or four-week period of glory, I was popular. And that's how I got the bug. From then on in, it was like, I'm an actor. I'm an actor. And I, of course, as I began to continue to study and my parents very graciously kind of signed me up for acting classes in New York City with a couple of soap opera actors, Ed and Dorothy Bryce, late, late lamented, um, I began to fall in love with the work because of the work. And I have a deep affection and respect for what it means to be an actor. I taught acting for many years. Um, so I, I joke around, but I always knew that's what I was going to do. Oh, that's awesome. I, I love that. I love that. And I, I'm curious because you, you mentioned something and I've I've doing this a couple of years now and I've talked to many, many actors and comedians and directors, and all these people. And there's always this similar there's a, a nugget that's similar in a lot of these stories you hear, you know, it's it's people that that moved from what oh. might have been town to town and it's yeah. been a very young age. They were city yeah. to city and town to town. And there's this I wonder if there is. um is there a, a kernel of truth in that the need to adapt, the need to be a chameleon to your surroundings? Did that, did that, did that bring about the love of acting or did that, you know, like, like w- with the chicken or the egg, right? Was it, was it the fact that you had to be that way that made you enjoy the acting or was it that doing that made you, I don't know. Uh, I I certainly could see that as being a big component part of what it is that brings somebody into, you know, and put it this way, there are two reactions you could have to being a stranger in a strange land. You can either hide or you can, you can, you know, you know, hop up on a tree stump and say, hey, everybody, I'm new. Mm. And I, you know, the people who do the latter are probably going to go into this business and the people who do the former are probably going to write novels. Um, (laughs) And I, I, much as I'd like to read, I knew I wasn't going to be a novelist because it's lonely. Mm. And I, I, you know, I like being around people. I studied writing all through college. I, you know, briefly entertained some illusion that maybe I could write. But I knew in my heart of hearts that there was no way I was going to go to the library carol and spend all day writing when I could go to rehearsal and flirt with pretty girls and go out and have beers afterwards. It was like, no, no. Hmm. Interesting. So you, like, like we said, we talked about uh, the, the seven hours of judgment. 
what is like how early in the process was that for you like how how much had you been auditioning how much had you been getting out there was yeah it, was it quick for you Did it well, take a while? Yeah, i mean for one i i did not have any 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 aspirations to be in film and television i was a stage actor i was convinced i was going to be a stage actor and of course at the age of 21 you know you're so wet behind the ears you think it's like it's going to be hamlet and then the middle of the middle of the middle of the on the st- london stage and first part i got cast in when i moved to seattle washington primarily to visit my parents who had relocated and i hadn't seen them for some time i was going to school in the east coast they moved they hadn't even told me they moved it's like mom dad where where, where are you the house is not here and there's no like note or anything i tracked them down i had a private detective tracked them down all the way across the fucking country they went i found them and i started auditioning in seattle and it was theater gigs that i got and the very first one i got I played a retarded boy who had cerebral palsy. I thought, oh, I'm not going to play Hamlet. I'm a character actor. And I did, you know, oddballs and, and, and deviance, as I have done my entire career for a number of years. And then the limited amount of film and television that was available in Seattle. I auditioned. And I think, I think that was the first uh, film gig I got. I don't know that it was the first... Uh, uh, acting credit right well first film or television acting credit um it it probably was i did northern exposure i did you know a a couple of things commercials there wasn't a lot in the Mm -hmm. seattle area and one of the reasons i eventually moved i had a theater company that adapted fiction for the stage i was a teacher i wasn't making any money and there was even less film and TV after a certain point. It all went to Canada than there had been when I first moved there. I thought, all right, and my first marriage ended. It was like, okay, I, I got I to gotta make a change. So I, I moved to L.A., got into film and TV, and you know, I haven't done a stage play in 10 years or more. Um, so, you know, life. Hey, <laughs> that, the old that. saying, life is what happens when you're making other plans. That's right. That's right. Uh, from... Captain Wayne in the chats. He says, uh, "I bet the West Wing was interesting." Any any fun stories coming out of that episode? Uh, yes. Yeah, for those who didn't watch the West Wing, there was an episode, "Big Block of Cheese Day," which they did a couple of times. Which is when uh, in the Bartlett White House, um, the administration says that on a given day, all the high level staffers have to meet with every lunatic knocking on the door for an appointment. This had to do with back in the days, one of the presidents invited everybody in to eat of a big block of cheese. Big block of cheese day. I represented a group called the, um, uh, uh, something like map makers of, of social conscience. I can't remember what it was, but I was there to basically peddle the concept of the Peter's projection map, which actually is a real thing. And I've gotten a lot of notice because of that one, one day of work because the Peter's projection map actually argues that the map that we are used to is bullshit. It mm-hmm. misrepresents the size and scope and positioning of various continents and that there's an eth- ethnocentric reason it does that. Mm-hmm. Africa is represented as half of its actual size because obviously we all know why. And so, yeah, um, I got to work with Alison Janney, who was a doll. But mostly what's interesting is that it's become one of those little clips that comes all, all over the place. I see the Peter's projection map clip. Oh, yeah. I've seen it quite a few times. Um, so let's, I mean, I, we gotta, we, we'd we be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit of Star Trek. Because right. I don't want to uh, be remiss. We, we'd be remiss. I, I'm trying to use big words like you. Okay, I was in the infantry. I was a grunt. I, I, I know very little bit of big words, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> I want to uh, yeah. sound smart. <laughs> Uh, hey, believe me, I was in, I was in the Denobulan Infantry. The, the, I was a yeah. medic in the Denobulan Infantry. I should have started with that. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's your military connection. <laughs> my military connection. Yeah, I didn't uh, think, frankly, when that came up in the storyline, it's like I don't know if the Denobulans have an infantry. That doesn't seem quite. Uh, I maybe. mean, it's they got to put the dumb people somewhere. I'm just oh, saying, like that's shaw, that's shaw. that's usually where they put the infantry guys. It was just the shaw, dummies. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, you did, you did 91 episodes as Dr. Flox and, 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 and when you, when you get, okay, so I'm, I'm trying to, before we talk about like the prosthetics in a minute, cause I'm sure that's extensive and, and a lot, but when you first, you know, find out, okay, you're going to be in this show in the Star Trek, which is at that point, I mean, it has a rich, rich yes, history, has. you know, yes, decades yes. worth 
I mean, what is that? What does that mean to you outside of, Hey, it's a job and I'm getting paid. Like, what did it mean to you when you, when you first booked that role? That was no small, you know, um, I mean, to the extent that I'm dancing, it's because I got a house. I can buy a house. Um, of course, it only went four years, not seven. But at the time, you know, one had reason to believe that if you got a Star Trek show, your next seven years were accounted for. I was definitely, I was not a huge Star Trek fan. Doesn't mean I didn't like Star Trek. I just wasn't a huge television mm-hmm. watcher. So I've, I've never been able to say, oh, oh, oh. But I certainly had my finger on the pulse of popular culture enough to know what it represented, and sure. it represented a significant life change for me. Um, and I knew instinctively that I was going to love the fact that I could travel the world for the rest of my life on the company dime because I was on Star Trek, or that I could go into a bar anywhere in the world and say, if I'm just loud enough, back when I was on Star Trek, and somebody would buy me a Manhattan. Those are two things that I knew immediately I was mm. going to, my wife said, this is a good job for you. It's like, I know, I know. <laughs> I uh, love it. I love it. Yeah. I'd, I'd be the same exact way. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. No yeah. shame in the game, man. I absolutely. Oh, no, it's great. <laughs> I mean, it has been of all the things that, I mean, candidly, it's one of the reasons I'm doing this uh track talks thing it's because i've gotten to know so many amazing and wonderful people both actors on the show and folks associated with the shows but mostly doing conventions for 20 some years and cruises is you know some very good friends of mine i met because they were fans and some you know dear hearts who i may not be close to but every time i see them it's like hey how the fuck are you i may not watch the shows but you know the people are grand yeah yeah, it's. I mean, it's a. It's. It is a community. It's a. It's a yeah. brotherhood, uh, in and of itself. Even if you're not on the same show, yeah. same same decade, so like it's yeah. a community yeah. that you're part I mean, of. I adore Bob Picardo, and I've gotten to be. You know, I love. Ch- I, well, I could go on and on. I mean, you know, there's so many lovely folks, and yeah. uh, you know, you don't get that on any other. I mean, going back to 1966, where there are five track shows on the air right now. I mean. I don't think there really is anything like it in popular culture. Absolutely. Um, Couldn't agree more. I, I thought we were the show that killed the franchise. I will say, I thought it was like, okay, this is going to be what's going to go on my fucking tombstone is John Billingsley actor on show that killed star Trek. Yeah. So when the movies came back, there was a little bit of a whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody wants to be the final nail. Nobody no, wants I, know. To be the... <laughs> I, I know. I know. I've been on too many you know, shows that bombed to kind of like, it's like, oh man, even my Star Trek one was the one that fucking bombed. Come on. Four years, nothing to sneeze at 91 episodes. And, but, but let's, let's talk. You wore a lot of prosthetics. I mean, what was that process? It could have been a lot worse. Um, I think by the time they got to enterprise and maybe even by the time they got to Voyager, I think this is a lesson they might've learned on deep space nine. You know, when you're dealing with with uh, mouth prosthetics and when you're, you know, encasing somebody in so much uh, head that it becomes uncomfortable and you're also working them 14, 16 hours a day, there's a law of diminishing returns. You know, you're going to drive your actors psycho. So although I was in the chair for two and a half hours, I had a chin, I had some ears, I had little eyebrows. And most of it was paint. Mm. So it really was not that uncomfortable. Now, you still have to be in the chair for two and a half hours, and you still have to have, you know, 45 minutes of it getting taken off. It's not like Mission Impossible where you get to rip the head off. You have to unglue it, and Mm. you have to steam your face. So it's, you know, when all things said and done, it's about three and a half hours of additional time you tack on to what could sometimes be a 12 or 13 hour day. Right. I wasn't in a ton. I mean, I was in enough, but I was number seven on the call sheet. So there are a lot of episodes when I got to, in fact, I had a little song I used to sing to irritate my fellow cast members. Day off, day off, six days off and the checks still come. A character actor in the sun, six days off and the checks still come. Then Dominic said, do not sing that song anymore. So I will fucking beat the shit out of you. It's like, all right, fair enough. Didn't stop me, but I'm faster than he is. I love that. I love that. Um, 
a great great comment from the chat. Uh, so Captain Wa- Captain Wayne said, "I just I just want the Star Trek food uh, assimilator thing." So that made me think if if you could have anything, any piece of technology from the the Star Wars or Star Star Trek canon, uh, what what's what's your what what's that thing? What's that thing you would absolutely take uh, if given the opportunity? Well, the fundamental difference between me and a Star Trek guy is that Star Trek guys have confidence that the technology is going to work. And I have zero confidence in technology. Like, it would be great to go into, like, one of those, and then you're, then you're in Paris. I mean, yeah. that would be great. But I'm afraid my, my, like, little molecules would be floating off in the fucking, you know? There's a wonderful Sam Shepard monologue I used to do years and years ago about that. It's a monologue about a guy who's getting, like, you know, in that, you know, blah, blah, blah thing. And then he realizes, like, I'm not getting put back together. Mm. Oh, fuck. I'm not getting put back together. Similar to a wonderful poem and a very <laughs> scary poem by um, uh, James Dickey uh, about it's the inner monologue of a woman who gets sucked out of a plane. <laughs> and it's her like inner, you know, stream of consciousness as she's falling to her death. Um, so yeah, it probably a food thing would be the way I'd go. You know, <laughs> if it comes to shove. It's like it, it's. Just, Worst that could happen is, yeah, yeah. they overcooked the hamburger. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It didn't it didn't have the sauce. I like. No, you're right. The teleporter, like that, that could go so wrong in so many so, ways. So yeah. wrong. Oh, mm. I know. And the transmitter. I mean, we already got that. I don't know. I mean, the the little thing that goes, Meh, you have cancer. Meh, you've cured it. I mean, that would be kind of handy, I guess. Like that. That. that I, yeah. That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. But my problem is I'm maladroit. I wouldn't be able to use any of the goddamn technology. I'd be like, Bonnie, I can't get the fucking thingy to turn on. It's like the food isn't that good, Bonnie. It's like, oh no, I've given myself cancer. I have it on the wrong setting. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I've I, cured I can things I don't have. I fucking tie my shoelaces, much less turn on a bunch of shit. Um, so on top of doing the the Enterprise, which was such a which was such a huge huge thing obviously uh for your career um you've done other things that were like in and of around so like you had an episode of star uh stargate Star one eight yeah yeah you know uh um an episode of roswell that, oh, that yeah. used the enterprise set where you played yourself how weird yeah. was that playing yourself well, on I, an episode this, of tv these are things that are always interesting about a career is the only reason i did that episode of roswell is because no other actor would do it they want a little crossover thing, you know? It's like, hey, would somebody from Enterprise come and be themselves auditioning, you know, in the room with, I don't even remember the, you know, context. And it was like, I was the only one who said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. I'm going to get paid for it, right? Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> so I also went to the Rose Bowl parade years and years ago. I was on The Others, which was a very short-lived show on NBC in 1999, as sort of a spooky, ghosty kind of show. And uh, they wanted to know if anybody in the cast would like, you know, do a little promo live at the Rose Bowl parade. And everybody said no. It's like, well, I'll do it. So, like, yeah, I get to be on the I get to be on the Rose Bowl parade. Safe. I hadn't realized you have, you have to get up at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's like they make you get there some ungodly hour. It's like I'm not like driving a float or run, I'm not like twirling a baton. Why do I have to be here so early? Uh, hey, say yes to everything. I, no, I know. I've... Actually, that's what I learned. I learned. I don't know. No, it's more like the military thing when they ask for volunteers and everybody backs up to let that yep. one guy. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then on top of it, you did an episode of the Orville, uh, a, a, a kind of a love letter to to the old I school did, stuff, which I was not. Uh, they didn't offer that to me. Mm. I just auditioned for it. And I think it's because the casting director didn't probably have any association with, didn't know I was on Star Trek. It just knew me as an actor. So she asked me to audition. And I said to my agents, could you tell her that I was a doctor on one of the iterations of Star Trek? And maybe they should just offer it to me? Because, and I get called my agent. Oh, uh, no, they want you to audition. Mm. <laughs> you fuckers. I so mean, I, you know, you would think anybody that has like, uh, it's on their resume. I was I was so and so on on whatever Star Trek show. They should be welcoming you guys with open arms. Uh, well, you yeah, think? Um, I, I never quite. I tried to make fun of uh, of uh, Seth MacFarlane, but uh, he, he was elusive. I could never corner him on the set. He apparently also does a very good Doctor Flox impersonation. I couldn't get him to do that either. Mm, yeah, he's. I'm sure he's a, he's a busy guy. He's got a lot he's of a busy guy, and he's fleet of foot. I tried. Believe me. <laughs> 
a lot of the, and speaking of playing a doctor, I was going through your your kind of your IMDb, your your filmography. You've played a lot of doctors. You've played a lot of professors. You've played a few coroners. There are a number of child molesters too. That's uh, <laughs> that doesn't jump out quite as quickly, but they're there. Uh, I, I didn't want I didn't want to point that one out. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, is there anything to like? Do you think there's anything about you that screams these well, characters? Well, look, look at me, honey. I mean, you're not going to have me jumping out of a fucking plane. I'm not yeah. going to be, you know, I mean, that's Special forces. It doesn't strike me as yeah, special forces no, Green Beret. No, exactly. I'm not, no, no, exactly. I'm not even like a guy behind the desk in the Pentagon. Nobody's going to believe I was a general. Now, people can definitely believe I was a professor, so there you go. Mm. It's a very visual industry also, you know, I mean. In all seriousness, one of the things you really have to make your peace with, particularly in film and TV, even on stage, is that is that the first impression an audience have of, has of you is primarily based on what your your presentation, sure. your visual presentation is, and producers are a lot less likely to cast you against type than one might like because they feel like they've just asked the audience to kind of push a boulder uphill, you know. It's like he's not a he couldn't be a Sure. So I, I did an episode of a show called, uh, oh, Jesus, I don't remember what it was. It was Andre Brower. It was short lived, a, a doctor show. And I was cast as a mayor of Boston. And uh, I went, well, the director seemed to like it. I, Andre liked it. I, I, I thought, you know, that was fine. I had a call from the director saying, ah, so we all love you, but the network didn't think you were mayoral enough. <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? And then I watch the episode. It's like, you know, the politician, he's like, you know, he's like, he looks like a white hair. And, you know, it's like, you, you just kind of have to buy into that. If, if you want to break and elbow your way into unusual categories, I would have been, I would have had to drop 40 pounds. I would have had to wear lifts in my shoes. I would have had to have a hair weave. I would have had to cap my teeth. I'd have to like, you know. I could have probably gotten a few more things over here and over here and over here and over here, but uh, it just wasn't in me. Mm. In it. Sure. Hey, yeah. know, know your role, know, know where you fit, where your piece of the I, machine, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not even, I, I, I have considerably less uh, ambition to, and that's one of the things that happens as you get older is, you know, well, two things happen. One is you you make enough dough to go, oh, now I do this for love. Oh, well, I don't have to now. <laughs> so suddenly it's like, ah, I'm going to pass on that. It's like, no, nah, I've done that before. And it's like, no, nah, actually, I'm going to take this vacation. And I, I just found that although I still really like to act, I enjoy it when I do the, when I do the work, I don't particularly, I don't live it, eat it, breathe it, sleep it. Mm. You know, you paid your of, dues. There are just a lot of other things that I like about life that I like doing. I like to travel. I love my pals. I love my missus. I, you know, I, I love to read, blah, 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 blah. I like to act. It is one of the many things on a list of things that I enjoy, but it ain't number one with a bullet. Nice. That's awesome. Um, let me ask you about, you played a supporting role in 2003, the thriller Out of Time. You were the medical examiner yes. and best friend to uh, Denzel Washington. What was... I can I can imagine that must have been uh, an interesting uh, to role to play. Uh, well, again, this is where you know this is a very strange and bizarre industry. It was a great part um, in a in a in a very well crafted uh, B picture. What back in the day would have been the second movie on a double feature, a, a noirish. I thought Carl Franklin, marvelous director, did a great job making pretty pulpy material really fun and you kind of ride over the absurdities of the story because it's got a sparkle to it and it was kind of a buddy comedy you know to a certain extent at least my part with Denzel's however the only reason I got the part is because Denzel had the right of a refusal and he basically vetoed everybody who was a name <laughs> because he didn't want anybody uh, you know getting too much press as happened with devil uh, in a blue devil devil in a blue dress Don mm -hmm. Cheadle got a lot of attention and I, I was like, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm supposed to have like this, you know, sidekick. I, so, uh, you know, no, no, no good actor. Good. No, no name. No, no him. Who the fuck is that? Cast him. That's the only reason I got that. Hey, 
I mean, there's there's worse reasons to get a job. <laughs> I know, but it, it just it's it's interesting, you know, sure. how the how the sausage gets made in Hollywood is very funny. No, I like that. I I, I appreciate you sharing that. It's good. Uh, question from Heath. He wants to know when uh, when you were in a position, you started you know booking work and you know financially stable. He wants to know what was your first big purchase. What did you splurge on? Oh, the house. The house. I mean, you know, I'm sure there was, you know, the first time we like, you know, dropped serious moolah on a really nice dinner. But I got the 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 others in uh, 1999. But I'd begun to get some consistent work in probably 98. And I think my wife and I in 98 were beginning to go. She also was a stage actor who was kind of moving over to film and TV. And our paths were very similar. We began to work, you know, much more consistently, you know, after a year or so. And I think we both kind of hit a place where it's like, I think maybe we don't have to fucking panic quite so much. And I'm sure there was a night when we went out to dinner and we probably said, let's get the $40 bottle of wine. <laughs> where, you know, but the big purchase was a house. I mean, deciding, you know, I never, honestly, I, as a theater guy, thinking that was going to be my life i really was fairly convinced because i didn't have wealthy parents my 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 mom died fairly young and my dad when he left you know left behind like forty thousand bucks so for me it was always going to be like you know i'm just going to have to scrape i'm just going to scrape and that's okay I, i'm fine i don't need money uh coming in to some money consequently was like uh, I, I, I couldn't wrap my brain around it. I couldn't wrap my brain around the concept that I could buy a house. It just seemed inconceivable, mm. particularly in Los Angeles, which is a lunatic market. We got lucky because the market was kind of at a, at, a, at a peculiar dip, and we found a place in the hills that was well under what it should have been. And we just went, we'll take it. We'll take it. We'll take it right now. What can we do? What can we do? Oh, I'll suck your cock. Give me this house. <laughs> Yeah, I know a lot of people that have been in that same situation where you're just like, got to yeah. jump, jump at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and um, it, that was Bonnie talking, by the way. That wasn't me. Um, so we got it. And, uh, you know, it was... <laughs> and awesome. I, yeah, and I was somebody also as a theater actor. It's like, you know, I I can't, I can't, I lost count of all the places we lived in. I mean, I, I was born in uh, Media, Pennsylvania. This is just growing up with a corporate dad, but... Lived in uh, Media, Pennsylvania, connected in New York, Fayetteville, New York, Huntsville, Alabama, Slidell, Louisiana, New Orleans. Two houses in Connecticut, went to school in Vermont, lived briefly in London, lived briefly in Chicago, had one, two, three, four, five, six places in Seattle, moved to Los Angeles, had one, two, three, four. We've now lived in this place for, for 23 years. And uh, it's like, no, I am never moving. <laughs> <laughs> they will wheel me out of this place. I know that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that's oh, that's wonderful. I'm I'm happy for you that you guys deserve that. Um, couple more questions for you. So, uh, fans of the series Cold Case, oh uh, yeah, would would probably know you really well as the as your guest appearance was the show's second season playing serial killer George Marks, the only killer on the show to get away with murder. Although you you died later on, yes, but... I, I yes I died later on, and I I hated the second episode. Episode. The first episode I liked because I liked the fact that he's like, I got away. And mm -hmm. He was so full of himself. Then he kind of has to give himself up for completely arbitrary reasons. I loved the woman who wrote the episode and she was a doll. Uh, Vina Sud, I think was her name. And sometimes you just, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. They want this guy to come back. He needs to get his come up. And so you got to figure out how to do it. Yeah. But I thought the finale of that season where I basically, you know, engineer my own suicide i i you know connive my way to give a gun to the female cop so she can kill me it's like there was nothing in the character that suggests this guy he loves what he does he's not mm. gonna fucking kill himself sometimes you gotta you gotta you gotta put this was it the I, I, uh the i cashed the check <laughs> you, i didn't protest i didn't protest the check <laughs> No, no, no. You, you have a limited ability as a guest star, especially even if you're a series regular, you have a limited ability to pipe up. Right, right. Yeah. I, I, I read somewhere that, you know, on like a movie set, you know, the director 
is you know he's he controls everything it, everything goes through him and everything but but that for something like a tv series it's the writers that have all the power they're the ones that that it's kind the of, show the show runner and show frequently runner. that is the show creator not mm-hmm. always um ultimately it is the show creator you know sometimes the creator of a show might have, you know, um, a, a number of shows that they're, you know, that they have created. And so individual shows are being managed by the basically show runners who are also writers. They're the people who you would go to. And if it ever reached a point where it needed to be legislated by the creator, that call might go up the, the ladder. But yes, you're right. The director has a lot of say so um but is not the ultimate arbiter in those instances mm-hmm. where there's a real ruckus okay uh, although generally speaking i gotta say as an actor it's like it does not behoove you as an actor to 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 call the you know it's like i'll go over your head is not something right that's like, those are words you ruffle should, feathers don't do it <laughs> don't do it you won't you won't find more work after that um <laughs> <laughs> you make the director's choice function. That's your job. Your job is to work, is to do your job and do the best you can. I mean, it doesn't mean you don't have a conversation. Mm. I mean, I think if you get, as, as you get older as an actor, one thing you become much more sophisticated with is the ability to make your pitch succinctly and clearly and in a way that gives the director confidence that you know exactly how to do what you think is going to work. Mm. And, and you basically have to figure out how to language it in very active terms. This is what my character is trying to achieve. This is how I think he's going after it. And that's why I think the scene functions in this way as opposed to that way. But if the director says, no, nah, that's it. Mm. All right, here's an open-ended question for you from the chats. What do you think of the state of writers and storytelling going on these days? Well, I love the fact that streaming has taken some of the, um, you know, for lack of a more um, apt term, some of the blue nosery out of television. I mean, you know, I'm I'm an adult and I don't want somebody saying, oh, you can't see a bear buttocks. You can't use that word. You can't have that. That's no, I don't want this. That's not a story my children are going to. I love the fact that, you know, you can now find a, a wide range of sophisticated and mature storytelling a- across all these streaming channels. And in that sense, I think it's the golden age of television. And I certainly think that a lot of people who are inclined to be novel writers or people who are savvy enough to know how to adapt novels are really profiting from a format that allows you to tell a long form story, let's say over the arc of two or three seasons or over 10 episodes, but that has a beginning, a middle and an end. Old television where it's, you know, seven seasons, eight seasons, 10 seasons, nobody dies. And it's just, they repeat, they repeat, they repeat, they repeat. That's still around for folks who dig it. I mean, you know, there are still umpteen iterations of NCIS. Personally, I kind of find that snoozy, you know, and if you went back in the Wayback Machine to 1973 and you saw the things on television where I could watch Ironsides or Welcome Back Cotter or, you know, Bonanza or whatever, I mean, go watch those shows right now. It's like, I'm really glad I'm alive right now. (laughs) It's coming price. What you don't have is you don't have the robust film, you know, I mean, you still have a lot of great films on Mm. streaming. But when I was growing up, it was like, you know, we went to the movies all the time mm-hmm. and I saw great movies. Um, I, I think that there are still great filmmakers, but the nature of the economics of the industry and the nature of the economics of multiplexes are such that it, you just, you know, I, 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 it makes me sad that kids, you know, I think don't get to experience what it's like to be a movie junkie. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have no follow up. That's such a great answer. <laughs> such a great answer. Um, uh, you also did. I found in your in your filmography, uh, you got some voices in video games. You did uh, the bit, voice, yeah. the voice of Trask, Trask in Ultimate Spider Man, and the voice of Metallo in Superman Returns. Oh five oh six. Uh, what was what was that experience like dabbling in uh, video game work? Not my forte, and nothing I nothing I you know is completely rando in all candor. I mean, you know, I don't even remember. I don't remember the gig, and I don't remember how I got the gig. I have a theoretically, I have a voiceover agent, but I know I never call, and he never calls, and that's fine by me. 
I, I don't, I mean, I like the idea that you can do the job in your underpants. I like that. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be a voiceover artist, you need a home studio, you know, I mean, sure. it has to be, and it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole separate gig. Like being a commercial actor is a separate gig. Being a stage actor is a separate gig. There are people who do a really good job at kind of um, working in all of these spheres. For me, I kind of felt when I began to segue out of stage, it was like, no, I tried commercials. Uh, uh, it's too grueling. Voiceover, and mostly it's commercials too, and they don't pay a lot. Film and TV. And I'm going to keep my focus there. I'm going to put my energies there, and that's it. So if I've done a, a, a little tiny bit every now and again in a cartoon, it's utterly random. Somebody called me. I didn't fight for it. I love it. I love it. It's one of those things like, hey, try it. Let's see what happens. And then you're like, eh, it's not for me. It's not for me. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind the. I don't, you know, I mean, it's just not, I find it, I, well, to me as an actor, it's like the whole instrument is at play, you know? Mm. It's like, oh, but they can't see my puss. <laughs> You know, I'm a gesticulator. I need yeah. to have just behind a microphone. It's amazing what talented voiceover artists can do. And it's amazing what a lot of my friends do reading books on tape. I have no end of, of respect and appreciation for the craft. It's just not where my I'm just not drawn to it myself. Yeah. Yeah. No. All right, we we are running we're running close to the time, man, because this is we're having such a good time. The time flies by. A couple couple more questions, and then we'll we'll let you go. Fire away, fire away. I'm in no hurry. <laughs> uh, two thousand eight, you you did uh, seventeen episodes on True Blood as coroner Mike Spencer. What was, I'm just yeah. curious that 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 was uh that was you a saw show. A lot of me. You saw that, a lot of me. If you that watched. was. That was that was a show that 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 hit a certain population at a certain time and vampires were hot. Uh, I'm just curious, what was the experience like uh, being a part of that? Um, my, you know, I was thrilled to get it because it was an Alan Ball show and he was coming off uh, Six Feet Under, which I thought was a, a fabulous show. And I, I kind of thought the gag was going to be that vampirism was sort of, you know, a metaphor for what it's like to be part of a non-traditional community. Hmm. and how non-traditional communities integrate or fail to integrate into mainstream communities. I hadn't anticipated it would become quite so wild and woolly and maybe a little bit more unhinged. For me, I wasn't necessarily over enamored with that. I sort of thought it was, it was crazy, but ultimately not, I won't say pointless, but not, not finally grounded enough for me. But that's an aesthetic. Doesn't mean I didn't think that people were doing, you know, great work. It just wasn't necessarily my aesthetic. My own character didn't have that much to do, except in the second season when uh, Michelle Forbes, a wonderful actress, Michelle Forbes, plays a sorceress who enthralls the entire town and has them basically engaged in a season-long orgy. So, uh, as I was saying to somebody earlier today on a competing podcast, um, this is a season of the podcast as I'm promoting the, the Trek talks. I, I would come home from work and my wife would say, what'd you do today? It's like, yeah, I've had sexual congress with a mule or a tree. I rubbed chocolate cake on some woman's breasts. I, you know, I got taken from behind by a stevedore. I don't know. It's just another day at work. Another day. Um, Tuesday. Yeah, yeah Tuesday. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. So I, I can't help but anytime mention, somebody mentions true, true, but it's like, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there was the, like, they, the, there are certain aspects uh, as a, as a, as a total peon, I, I know nothing of the arts, um, you know, but I'll, I'll watch, I'm enamored with what you actors do and, 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 and the whole scope of how things are made. But there's one thing where I'm like, I watch a show and whatever it be, you know, I don't know, Game of Thrones or whatever it is. And there are certain scenes you see where you're just like, wow, they can act the hell out of like, there's just naked people and fighting and, and, and things happening. And I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I could ever be that good an actor where I wouldn't just be like, what, what, what was that? Well, you know, <laughs> what's interesting is that it's that the main thing that I think people don't necessarily appreciate is the level of physical uncomfortability that, mm -hmm. that attaches to, to so much of what we do. I mean, sex scenes, you're, it's cold. You know, I mean, frequently it's just fucking cold. Um, you're asked to maintain somewhat uncomfortable physical positions. 
There was one story, however, which I do tell, which was an Please. episode. It was a pilot. Uh, what the fuck was it called? It didn't get picked up. It was sort of like a you know teen comedy about two teenagers who become teen detectives. And I was the villain in the episode. And there was a scene in the episode where I'm supposed to be like you know passionately making out with this absolutely gorgeous woman. And she was a gorgeous woman, very nice lady. I'm sure she was like, I hate this fucking job, and I'm thinking I love this job. Anyway. <laughs> We're making out, and I'm supposed to kind of like be, you know, bending her over a desk. And for, for various reasons, the desk, it, it wobbled, and they couldn't get the fucking shim in correctly. So a grip had to lie underneath the desk and basically hold the desk up. And I'm kissing the girl and kissing the girl. Cut. Now go again. Go again. We have a problem. Cut. Cut. Go again. Go again. You know, like a dozen times, and the girl's got razor burn. And I'm like, you know, all right, go again. And this grip is standing there looking at me, and he looks a lot like you. He looks up at me and says, all right. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. What can I tell you? That was one of the few times I thought, you know, it's like there are worse things. I get there. I get paid to do this. That's worse. <laughs> I hate fucking actors. <laughs> oh man! I mean, you're I mean, you're a grip. You're in the wrong business. If <laughs> well, and I guys, it's, it's true. It's like I'm sorry, man. You know, I know this is like the worst fucking job in the world. Hold up the desk while the the character guy makes out on top of you. Oh like, man, um, I mean, and, and okay, you've done so much in your career. We couldn't obviously touch everything on. Is there something that you've done that, like, you were just just for whatever reason super proud of it? You loved it, and 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 for whatever reason didn't get its fair shake. It, it, it not a lot of people see it. What should people go check out? Your favorite? Well, I don't even done? know if it's check outable. The nine was a short-lived show on ABC that I think came on in 2007. And it was airing at 10 o'clock after, the, after Lost. Lost was still on. And the premise was a group of us were abducted or held hostage when a, a bank robbery goes awry. Chai McBride, Kim Raver, Tim Daly, Scott Wolf, myself. Um, wonderful cast. It's hard to even explain. I think this is one of the reasons it was not successful. In the first half hour of each episode, in real time, you're seeing a half hour of the bank robbery. And in the second half, you're seeing the aftermath. So you know that it ended. You know some people survived and some didn't, but you don't know exactly what happened. It's really a show about the nature of the way trauma changes the way we think about living. But because they kind of wanted to have their action adventure cake and eat it too, which I understood... The audience was bifurcated, and I think the audience went, I don't know what I'm watching. I don't know if I'm watching a thriller or I'm watching a soap opera, and it bombed. My character was the guy who kind of is perceived as the hero who saves the day. I never really was entirely sure how much of that was actually legit because we didn't play out all the fucking episodes. Mm. But the, the series, to a certain extent, the 13 we made, in the second half of each episode, we're getting to see this guy who suddenly is a dweeb who was treated as a hero, his life is all transformation. So on television, it's very rare to get to play a character where every episode is like, you know, I quit my job. I'm leaving my wife. I'm having an affair. I'm climbing a mountain. I'm falling off the mountain. Well, I'm getting back up again. You know, that was to me like a very rare and unusual treat. And I was very, very sad when that show was like, mm. Well, but you'd be hard pressed to find those thirteen episodes. <laughs> you, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. But we do. I, I I got Mike in the chat says he loved that show. So you got people that did watch. I mean, oh yeah. Well, I mean, you know, even even the flops still have millions of people who watch. It's just you know, unfortunately, the the numbers game is such that you need. But back then, this is before streaming. Streaming's changed a lot of things, you know, the nature of how many people watch a show now, a show could survive without as much of an audience um, if it's on a streaming service. And, and, and but, do you think, too, some of some of it plays into the um, with the advent of of social media, of the Internet, where you see these like fan petitions bring back this show and and like a show gets canceled and then you know, 100,000, 500,000 people sign and, and it comes back. Is that, is that obviously something more I think, prevalent? I think, it's, I think it's more, I mean, that certainly could, you know, be a contributing factor. I think more of it is, you know, back in the day, again, you go back in 1973, it's like, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC, a show in, 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 that, in an eight o'clock time slot might be getting 12 million people. That's not enough because there are only three options. Nowadays, there are 18 gajillion channels, and it's all, it's all a menu. 
So there really is, you know, there's, it's true to a certain extent that you can still kind of have a Nielsen ratings. But generally speaking, the entire landscape and the nature of how they evaluate success, it's, there's so many different metrics now. It's no longer about necessarily how many people watch this show. It's, you know, what particular audience watches it? How quickly do they watch it after it premieres? How many people watch it a second time? How much does it cost to make? Can they reduce the cost of it? Is it going to, I mean, I, I. How engaged they are with the content. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very, I mean, you know, sometimes now it's like they only, they only be planning on making 20 episodes in the first place. So it's not so much a thing about canceling it. It's like, well, we just purchased it. We purchased the whole fucking thing outright. It's a very, very different landscape. In most respects, it's better. In one respect, it's a little problematic, which is that the residual streams for actors are, are, are you know, are not as robust. Mm. Back in the day, you'd get primetime reruns and shows if they were successful to go to syndication. And four and two would be, you know, pretty good revenue streams. And for most actors, 15 percent. This is something that I always remind people of. The people who are in our union, SAG, after it. 85% of them are making about $15,000 a year or less. And those are people who are in the union. <clears throat> Shitload of actors don't even get into the union. Um, most people who are actors, and I, again, feel very, very privileged and lucky that I had a successful career, but most people who are actors, they're surviving to a great extent on their residual streams. As the residual stream goes down, you get a little more desperate to take a job, so you also have less negotiating power. So, you know, the nature of, of how actors make a living these days, it's a much more parlous and I think kind of tricky business mm -hmm. for actors. Young actors who I meet, it's like an entirely different conversation. How you pursue the work and what your expectations can be about what kind of living you can make. Wow. Well, I mean, thank you for, for sharing that and, be, and being so honest because uh, people need to hear that. People need to know that. Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's still a lot of great work, and I would never encourage, discourage somebody from going into the arts, but, you know, film and television is a business as well, and it's a tricky business. It's a tricky. Absolutely. Uh, so you, you, and you'd mentioned this earlier, years you've been going to conventions and, and getting out there and, and, and meeting the people. I can only assume you've got some just wild, off-the-wall, crazy fan interaction story that you'd love to share with us. Well, the first one that comes to mind is I was at a convention with Dominic Keating, who was on Enterprise, and we were in San Francisco, and I brought my wife with me. And she, she suddenly, I should say, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you three stories at once. Please. My wife, who came to an early convention, said, do not bring me up on the stage. Do not point me out. I'm just going to stand in the back, mind my own business. I'm interested in watching, but do not, do not. So I told a story in which I basically suggested that Jolene was the gassiest Star Trek actress because she always walked around eating cheese. And she did. And she was. And from the very back of the auditorium, my wife said, pot calling the kettle black. And I was like, oh, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Bonnie Friederici got her up on the stage. She was in the act for the, for the last 20 years. Anytime we travel together, she and I are like, da, 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 da. Discovering that my wife and I have a low vaudeville act is, to me, one of the highlights of my life. Um, Anyway, so one of the early appearances with my wife, before she had been suckered into getting on stage with me, uh, she, went, she went off shopping while Dominic and I did a dog and pony show. And these two women from the audience, Stra Strawberry and Raspberry, or Boysenberry and, and Raspberry, they were named after berries. Uh, they stood up and, you know, they're sisters or best friends. And they said, Could we, can we come up and give you a kiss? Mm -hmm. And it was like, <laughs> so they came up. They didn't pay any mind to me. But they proceeded to lick Dominic, like all over, like they were like they were Wolverines. And I, I was just kind of fucking around. I was like, you know, making a joke to the audience, like, what am I, chopped liver? Uh, it's like, you know, strawberry, boysenberry. I'm not getting any berry licking here. <coughs> so cut, you know, that's kind of the end of the show. Dominic was like, all right, that's enough out of that. How you going? Here you go. Show's over. I'm leaving. I'm going to meet the wife. Um, I'm, I'm rounding the corner. Strawberry and boysenberry come running up. We're sorry, we're sorry, we'll lick you too. And I, I was like, no, I, and then he started to lick me and then Bonnie rounds the corner. And there there I am on a public sidewalk with these two, you know, nubile young berries just licking me all over. And um, it's like, 
Bonnie, this is boysenberry. This is raspberry. Um, funny story. <laughs> that, oh man. Oh, my face hurts from this. Oh man, that's um, so good. <laughs> I also was at a convention one time when, I don't know why these stories don't involve kissing, but it just, it just seems to be the theme of the night. There was a woman who came up. She was probably 80 years old. Her, her name was like, you know, um, um, Rihanna Nighthawk, or she, you know, she was decked up, you know, in kind of a, 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 a Native American guys and <clears throat> quite possibly she was a character that I just wasn't familiar with but she you know it was like a little old lady can I give you a kiss and I was like sure you can oh god I was like I've just been deep throated by by granny I, I was granny gang bang <laughs> um so yeah that, I mean that I <laughs> <laughs> not what I was expecting, but I'm, not what I was expecting either. Right? I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy right now. Um, this is gonna make for some great clips online. Just, I just oh. want you to know that. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, I give good podcasts. I give good podcasts. Um, um, these are all stories, by the way, that have now, you know, for those people who know me and have known me for 25 years, it's like, yeah, 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 the granny kissing story. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's all, it's all been out there. Um, well, I mean, I, we, we've held you long enough. I do, I do want to respect your time and, and this has been just an absolutely phenomenal conversation. I, I thank you so much for your time. I, anytime you want to come back, promote anything, hang out, just shoot the gab with us. You can tell us more crazy stories. We'd love to have you back anytime you want to come on. Um, I want to give you the last, you know, minute or two or whatever, uh, uh, promote anything you have coming up, yeah. uh, where people can find you, uh, any um, of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not a huge social media guy. Jay Billingsley 60 at Twitter. Um, <laughs> Elon Musk is making me seriously reconsider, but you know, unfortunately there doesn't seem to be really a place to go. So we hang in there. Um, I probably, the next thing you'll see me in would be, um, a show on Apple called, I believe, Manhunt, although I'm not sure if they're going to keep that name, which is based on a book by James Swanson about the hunt for Lincoln's assassins. I play, um, one of the, um, statesmen who ends up trying and convicting the assassins other than Booth at the very end of the, of the story. Um, and I would just do one last reminder that on January 14th, which is this Saturday from 10 in the morning to 6 p.m., 6 p.m., eight hours of fabulous Star Trek themed interviews and entertainment. Go to trektalks.net for all the information about Hollywood Food Coalition and how to watch the show. And uh, if you feel like watching and you want to support and we want to make sure that this happens again next year, this is the second year we hope to keep it going consider making a donation to the Hollywood Food Coalition. Outstanding. Uh, I, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, everybody, thank you guys for hanging out with us. And a bunch of you still watching. You guys are awesome. Uh, great questions. And this has been the amazing John Billingsley. I'll, I'll give you the last few seconds here, John, to sign off to the audience, tell them goodbye, and we'll toss it to a break. Thank you all. Thank you all for your service. And um, I know that that's sort of like, you know, is there some, this is a question I want to ask. Oh, go for it. In the military. How do you want people who weren't in the military to come up and acknowledge their appreciation? Is that a tiresome phrase? Uh, okay, we'll, ta we'll take a minute. This is a personal that thing. Comes, that comes up, right? No, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm so happy you brought this up and, and, and I'm happy to talk. I can't speak on behalf of every sure. service member, obviously. Uh, I, I, you know, I served from, you know, 2000 and three to 2007 when I was wounded in combat. And so I've been a disabled veteran for a long time as well. It is a, a bit tiresome to hear, you know, thank you for your service, but here's the caveat. Here's the thing. It's, it's, I feel it's when it's just thrown out there, regardless yeah. of the situation, you know, the same way you say, you know, there are good cops and there's bad cops and there's uh, good politicians and bad politicians. There's good service members and there's crappy ones. So when you just throw out a thank you for your service, it comes off as um, insincere. So what I always tell people is, if you want to give a thank you for your service and you truly mean it, yeah, ask them about their service first. Uh -huh. Hey man, where where would you serve? What you do? And then once they've acknowledged and say, oh, I, you know, I was in the infantry and I served, oh, I did tour in Iraq and Africa. 
then when you give that thank you for your service, I don't know, as, as a vet, it feels like you actually care. You yeah. actually, you, it's appropriate that, that you're thanking me because you took the time to actually care about my service versus just a, a platitude that gets tossed around like a bless you, you know? Yeah, yeah. So in those instances where the social situation doesn't permit that, where it's about, you know, as you say, something that is used more as kind of like a, a, um, a, a, a how do you do? Mm. Would, would you prefer that people not acknowledge or would you prefer that that I mean, I, I, so I, I think that I, I asked that in a way because I've talked and I know a lot of people who are veterans and I've heard a wide range of responses, mm. but it always really interests me because it's really as a civilian, it's so ingrained, like bless you, mm. that it comes out you're, without even necessarily thinking about it, because it's what we all have been kind of trained to say it's kind of the phrase right yeah it's the it's it's the natural reaction to like a chew bless you it oh you served thank you for your service service. yeah it just comes out um yeah and and you know it it, it, it's a tough thing like you said when when time is of the essence and you're just two ships crossing in the night yeah yeah i i am of the mind where i'm like if 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 you if there's not a a connection over about the service then then don't even bring it up. Don't even acknowledge it because we don't serve for the thank yous, right? The, 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 the true guys, um, God forbid there are people that out there just because they want the discounted Outback Steakhouse. I don't know. But for the most of us, we, we serve because that's just, that's just what we do. That's our calling, whatever. So we're not there for the thank yous. It's not like you walk by and I go, this motherfucker did not thank me for my service as he walked by. Um, so I'm still, I'm still reeling from the fact that you got a discounted Outback. (laughs) Home Depot's the best. That's the that's Second the one discount I go. Two discounts at Outback. Yeah, I, yeah. Ten percent at Home Depot. That's that's my go-to. Okay. I right. I use that. Um, but no, I'm 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 glad you ask, and and hopefully you know that that helps you feel better about it. But here's the thing: if you want to say thank you, say thank you. I mean, yeah. fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> if, they, if they don't like it, that's well, you know. Can um, I just tack that on? Thank you for your service and fuck you if you can't take a joke. Yeah. If you don't like it, fuck you. I don't care. I think they would appreciate that more than anything. A good, a good vet with a good sense of humor will appreciate that more than anything else. That's Uh, my luck. I'd meet the one vet that didn't have a sense of humor. (laughs) Yeah. There's some guy, you know, they have this stick up their ass. There's, there's those guys. We all know those people that just can't take a joke, but for the most part, I think there are a few, there are a few actors like that as well. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the, the the method guys goes too too serious. Take it too serious, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Next yeah, time. part two. We'll, 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 part two. We'll have that. But uh, <laughs> thank you once again, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, John Billingsley, the incredible, incomparable John's Billingsley. I'm gonna I'm gonna Google big words to say nice I'm things highly, about this guy. I'm very comparable. I assure you, I'm, I'm <laughs> extremely comparable. Awesome, guys. All right, guys, we're going to tell us a short break. I'm going to go say goodbye to John, and uh, we'll be back with more right after this. Bye.